Hello, my name is Bian Webster. I'm an engineering consultant and a instructor for the Linux Foundation. Today we're going to do an excerpt from the LF411 Embedded Linux course that covers a number of the different options that can be used to build an embedded Linux device without necessarily using an embedded distribution. Let's get started. We're going to talk about the root file system choices. Every embedded system has a root file system that is used to actually provide the functionality on top of the Linux kernel. The very, very first process that started when you enter into user space is called init. And there's a number of different options you can use for init. But init is always the ancestor of all other user space processes. And it always comes up as process ID 1. Now you can pass in which process is going to be your init process. But if, however, you don't pass one in, it'll actually then try and start some well-known names that are on the, on the root file system. You'll notice at the very end of the list, however, that if it can't find any other initialization process, it will start a root shell. So you can perhaps salvage a system if it's broken. So the big thing about the parent-child relationship when it comes to processes in user space is whenever a child terminates, it signals its parent process. And then the parent has an option to see why the, the child finished before its resources get uh, reclaimed by the Linux kernel. That happens through having a signal handler that handles the sig child signal. Now, there are a number of different options when it comes to the initialization process, but we're only going to cover two of them. The first one is something called system 5 init, and it's something that comes from the old Unix days. And it's based on a file called e slash etc slash init tab. It specifies all the configuration as to what happens in different situations. Now, for system 5 init, all the different systems are, are built into what's called a run level. Run level 0 is halt, in other words, turning your computer off. Run level 1 is for single user mode. Run level 2 is for multi-user mo mode and so on, up until you get to run level 6, which is reboot. For each one of those run levels, there's a directory in the etc directory called rc some number dot d. The dot d means it's a directory. And within each one of those directories, there's a link that goes back to the real initialization script that's in the etc init.d directory. All the links in the run level directory start with either a capital S or a capital K. Then two digits that are used for ordering, and then the rest of the name of the initialization link. As you enter a run level, all the S links are executed. As you leave a run level, all the K links are executed. And each script is is passed in a parameter of either start or stop. Start is, signifies that a service needs to start. Stop, obviously, is for stopping a process. Every Linux distribution does things a little bit differently. On some of them, they use a utility called check config in order to administer these links and build them for you. On other systems, they use a system called update-rc.d. It doesn't really matter. In both cases, they do the same thing. They just set up the appropriate link between the rc numbered dot directory to the real script in etc init.d. You'll find, for instance, uh, however, when you look at the actual commands that do the actual halt, shut down, or power off, for instance, in the case of halt, it's in slash sbin. It's actually a symbolic link back to the real implementation of it, which is slash sbin halt dot sysv init. You'll find similar links for shut down and for power off. The System 5 initialization system was originally designed for much larger enterprise-style computers, even though we still use it for embedded systems. But since it's considerably more complex, I can't cover all the features in this short little tutorial. If you want to learn more about how all these things work, there's a number of websites which we list here in the slides as to where you can find out more information. The other option is using BusyBox init. It's a single binary that brings in all the different Unix actions from the command line into a single binary to make it smaller for an embedded system. One of the options, or one of the applets as they're called, is, something, is the initialization process. And you can make it work by basically linking from slash sbin init to busybox itself. And the way that works is, is whatever the name of the application is when it starts up is what functionality it actually chooses to run internally. Now, BusyBox also uses init tab itself, just like System 5 init, but it uses a slightly different syntax. And we have an example of what one of those files looks like here in the slides. So you'll see in this particular case that there are startup items that are listed. So instead of being separate scripts, 
They're actually listed in, in here as, as initialization systems. So here you'll see that we're mounting different partitions. We're setting the host name of the system, and we bring up networking. At the very end, you'll also see that we have the option of running a series of scripts at the very end in the RCS directory. The lines a little bit further along start different terminals on different uh, virtual terminals or serial ports. Similar ways how you do it in System 5 Init. A little bit further down, you can see that we're logging different kinds of things. And further down from that, we specify what happens when you press Control Alt Delete. In this case, we do a reboot. And at the very end, you'll see the shutdown things that we do when we want to power things off. So if you look at each one of those lines, the third field in each one of those lines is actually a different word. And that specifies what happens with that particular command, whether something gets restarted, whether it's an initialization command, whether it's a shutdown command, and so on and so forth. And to find out more information, you can look at the slides here to figure out what each one actually does. The next thing we're going to talk about is dynamic device file creation. Everything is a file in Unix, and the same thing happens for device files, for device drivers. Now, there's a lot of different ways we handled it in the past, but to talk about the modern way, when it comes to the dev directory, it's usually now a temporary file system upon which we dynamically create uh, device nodes. And that's done by a user space program called UDEV, typically on most Linux systems. What UDEV does is it listens to the kernel such that when a driver comes up, the appropriate device file is made and any scripts that need to do anything more happen thereafter. Now, UDEV is an all singing, all dancing, do everything kind of system. And again, it was designed for servers and so on. It does work on embedded systems and it gives you the most functionality. However, since we're on memory constrained systems and so on and so forth, BusyBox provides a cut down version of UDEV called MDEV. Again, it provides enough functionality in order for your embedded system to work well enough. You're going to find that we actually can look at how that is set up in the slides here. We go into a lot more detail in the actual course itself. In order to get UDEV and MDEV working, there's a certain things that need to be turned on in the kernel. And if you look at the kernel configuration file, you'll find there's certain things like config hot plug that needs to be set up, things like config net, config Unix, and so on. These are things that are required in order for UDEV to interact with the kernel at a really low level through the file system. Now, as I said before, slash dev is where the device files live. And it's usually a tempfs, which is a RAM-based file system. It disappears when you reboot. And it's something that's created and populated at boot time during initialization. Now, in something like Angstrom, what it'll do is it'll actually run the script that you see at the top of the slide here. However, on something like a build root based root file system, it has a script a little bit longer that you'll see further down at the bottom. And again, they both do roughly the same sorts of things. They mount a file system, they start up mdev or udev, and uh, then they do the appropriate thing to create device dri files as needed when device drivers are started up. Okay, we've gone through initialization to start up system processes. We've got the system that brings up the device driver fi uh, node files properly. Now we're into the rest of user space. One of the big decisions you can make at this particular point of time is what C library is going to be used to link your utilities. Again, some are bigger, some are smaller. In the server or desktop kind of situation, we've got something called glibc. glibc is the GNU uh, C library. And it provides an all singing, all dancing implementation of the C standard and all the different things that come along with a modern Unix system. Now, C libraries have a tight coupling with the compiler that you're using. And that's because the compiler needs to know how to implement certain functionality through the C library. A lot of utilities that are used to build root file systems allow you to choose which C library you want to use. In the case of Angstrom, it defaults to using glibc. Again, it gives you the most functionality possible. On something like a build root, however, it defaults to the uclibc library. And that's because it comes from the same people who build root and uclibc developers are the same people. And again, that's because build root is meant for a much smaller, more memory constrained kind of system. So you can actually see on something like an angstrom with glibc, 
that in fact the C library is pretty close to five times bigger than UC libc. That's a pretty big savings in RAM and, and flash that you're using. So whereas libc might be over a megabyte, a UC libc C library is going to be something like yeah, a quarter to a fifth of that size. Now, there are more options than just glibc and uc libc. There's also a few others such as eglibc, dietlibc, and klibc. These all have slightly different uses, however. Something like klibc is actually used your initial RAM disk in order to boot your system before you have access to your real C library. eglibc is actually a special case. It was a situation where the glibc libraries were actually taken and optimized by the embedded developers. They felt that glibc was a little bit too heavy for what they wanted to do on embedded systems. So what they did is they took the source code and they made a number of optimizations, have it take less memory and maybe remove certain things that aren't used very much anymore. The ironic part is a lot of the big Linux distributions, the ones that run on servers, actually looked at this and realized that in fact it made their distributions better themselves. So for instance, if you're using something like a Debian or an Ubuntu, for instance, it says it's using glibc. In fact, it's using eglibc instead. It's using an embedded C library in order to actually make that system faster and use a little bit less memory. Now, beyond choosing C libraries, there's a number of other things you can choose to do. And that's things like whether or not you're going to statically link your binaries or whether you're going to use dynamic linking. Static linking leads to bigger binaries, dynamic to smaller. However, when you use dynamically linked libraries, there's a cost at startup time because your program may have to load into the memory and then it actually has to be linked before it can run at that particular point in time. The nice thing though is, is that through a, a, use, a careful use of static and dynamic linking, you can actually choose which libraries to use for different binaries. In other words, if your system is designed specifically to use UC libc but you need a couple of utilities that use glibc, what you can actually do is link those couple of utilities statically and still have the rest of the system use UC libc. It's as flexible as you need it to be. So hopefully this has given you a taste of LF411. Of course, it takes you from bootloader all the way through up into user space and the decisions that are made around that sort of thing. My name is Bian Webster, and I hope to see you in class sometime soon.